They might be outside playing. Uh, you know, they used to do it that way. You know, they used to uh, ring the bell. of his work yeah all righty well we're glad you're here tonight and uh, what a beautiful day outside had to flip it to air condition just to get the heat out of here it was um, again up to 74 degrees in here that's from the singing hallelujah. yeah hallelujah. <laughs> must be a choir member <laughs> that's great so did you enjoy the book of James last week and we just yeah is it really? Is it your favorite? Hmm. And we, 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 we just touched it, and uh, we hardly even examined it. We'll do more this week and probably next. I think it's going to take us three weeks to get through it. Actually, if you think about it, if you do a book like that, you could spend the whole year on it and just going through verse by verse. But that's not our intent. Our intent is to hopefully um, give an overview of the book. All right. Well, we have a few things to mention before we get started. Bob, why don't you give us an update on your daughter, Anne? And on Sherry. Okay. Let's be in prayer for um, for Anne. She's in Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach area, so pray, pray for, pray for her. In fact, she went through this because she had gone, and they thought that she had cancer, and and then they came back and said, no, we misdiagnosed it. You don't have cancer, and then all of a sudden her coughing didn't stop, and evidently something took place where she, she certainly does. Hmm. So be praying. Uh, we don't like the C word. No, that's for sure. We don't like the C word for sure. Okay, well, um, also, I got an update today on uh, Ron Bass. He's doing very well. He'll be released either Thursday or Friday to go home, and then from there he'll go on with care. The main thing is is that each day his face has to be um, cleaned well with some type of solution or chemical, or probably not chemical, but solution or whatever, and then um, new medicine has to be applied, and then the next day, the same thing as the skin begins to uh, recover. Uh, his eyes are not well enough yet to really check them fully to see if, um, if there's damage there or not, but uh, he is getting better. The swelling's going down, and uh, he um, is certainly, um, uh, they're very positive with the direction everything is taking. So I don't know how long that will take for him to get all the way back to, um, uh, back to um, health completely. Depending, I guess, once they can really examine him. But they just say his lungs are very clear, and they're not worried about his lungs as they were at first. So keep praying. Don said he appreciates the prayers for the family. Okay, does anybody here want to share anything? Maybe something that went on in your life this week or something you'd like to, to share? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. That's uh, that's a good testimony. That's a needed testimony. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Isn't it amazing um, 
I remember talking to Brother Holmshire as he was probably about 85, and he was telling me about, you know, how he wanted to um, uh, die faithful. He didn't want to, at the end of his life, and I said to him, um, being a young guy, not understanding things correctly, I said to him, I said, um, I said, uh, boss, you're, you're 85, you're okay. He says, that's what he said, he said, oh, he goes, you're awful naive about the flesh, aren't you? And so the flesh never gives up. Flesh fights all the way to the end to have its way, even at 85, so or 86, whatever he was at that time. It just, it's always a fight. They're in enmity with one another, and so it's always, always a battle. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Anybody else want to share anything at all? You sure? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. Thank you. That's a sweet testimony as well. I would just exhort you. I don't know your manner of reading, um, but I would try. Of course, read your Bible. That's the the key thing. And then also. Uh, about once a year, open up a theology book, like basic theology or something, and just kind of pick one of the doctrines and go through that again. And then also, uh, just as uh, Harmony has going a book, have, have, a, have, a, have a book that will challenge you in your walk with Christ. And uh, share it with somebody. It's fun. It's, it's fun to read it, isn't it? It's more fun to share it with somebody. I, if I read something, I'll send it out to somebody. I, hey, I just read this quote, you know. And it might not mean anything to them, but it did to me, and it's nice to share that. So, so be a reader. Readers are leaders, we know that, and uh, uh, thank you for those testimonies. Anything else? Yeah. What's that? Oh, I, I thought you were going like this. I'll tell you what, we'll give you a minute to get something. <laughs> all right. Don't, don't wave when I'm up here, because you get called. That's all there is to it. I'll stop the message and say, yeah, what, Nick? All right. The book of James is um, a penetrating letter. Think about that word, it's penetrating. It's one of those books where you read it, you probably already know before you approach it because it is a popular book, you hear messages out of it. What, what you really hear out of James a lot of times, which is dangerous, or any book in the Bible, is it seems like some books get quoted more than other books. Like there's some books you hardly ever hear a quote out of. You just don't, you don't really hear much out of Second Chronicles, 714 maybe. But there's a lot of verses, you know, and some of those books you just never, you never hear. But there's books like James where there's so many quotable verses that people use all the time. And so we have an understanding of it because of just those verses. But remember that all the epistles, all the books are to be read as a letter from start to finish before you start to study it. You can't just jump into it. You've got to get the flow of it. You've got to figure out what's going on, what's the time period, what's happening. And when you do, the letter makes a lot of sense. And so for like in James, we know he's, teach, he's, teach, he's talking rather to the 12 uh, tribes that are scattered. So we know that there's a lot of persecution. We can understand what they're going through as James pens this letter. It kind of gives you the heart. Uh, of James a little bit, that pastoral heart that he has as well. So James, um, we're not going to go back and recover what we did last week because we want to keep moving forward. So if you weren't here, um, you'll just have to kind of jump in and, and, and hang on. So, But James is a penetrating, a penetrating a letter. James is saying, you say you, say you have the root, meaning you have salvation. You're, you're, you're saying that, that's why you're coming, that's why you're here. Uh, you have that, but James says then, uh, the fruit should follow. So James is really big on saying not only is salvation is real in your life, but if it really is, then there ought to be this change going on that shows work or fruit. 
And fruit's very important in the Bible. We're not going to study that tonight. But fruit is really the measuring stick of our walk with Christ. It really is a way to measure if we're growing in Christ because biblical fruit can only be produced through God working through us. And for God to work through us, he has to change us. He has to change us. And that's what James is about. James is saying, listen, the fruit, the fruit rather, is always the direct result of the root. James is all about practical Christianity, where the rubber meets the road. He's just so practical, and um, that's helpful for us. Remember, those who have come to Christ are positionally perfect. So James is not mentioning salvation. He doesn't talk about the cross. He doesn't talk about getting saved. He doesn't talk about the blood of Jesus. He doesn't talk about the finished work of Christ. He does not talk about the Holy Spirit. He only mentions Christ twice in the whole book. He's really talking about that um, he's already under the assumption and assuming of who he's writing to that people understand that positionally we're born again, we're saved, our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. So that's why even if we're not having a good day and we get wiped out on the side of the road and we've been living that day pretty, not, not like we should be, we're still in heaven because positionally or we are, we are completely saved the moment that we ask Christ to be our Savior. That is taken care of. Our spirit is saved. It's perfect. Past, present, and future, God does not see our sins. And so, so, so with that understanding, uh, what he's working on then is the practical. And whenever you hear about practical Christianity, it's just another word for progressive sanctification. So what James is talking about here is not how you got saved or when you got saved or that. He's just saying, listen, you need to be growing in your sanctification. How's that going? Seriously. Sanctification never ends. Someone just, both those testimonies about the flesh, you know, the flesh is always there. It's always an enmity with God. Sanctification never ends. The Holy Spirit never stops working on changing you into the image of Christ. It never stops. It's constantly working on you. We have that in, um, in uh, uh, Philippians 1.6. Uh, he that have begun a good work in you will perform it until what? The day, the day of Jesus Christ. And so we know also in uh, Romans 8, 29, that uh, those that are born again, sanctification will take place. There, 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 there is no doubt about it. Now, it comes at different speeds in people's lives. But sanctification is always at work. And that's what um, Peter, I mean, James is really working on. It's the outward manifestation of the inward change. That's what, that's what James said ought to be seen in our life. Uh, faith that is alive has works. If not, it's dead. And we're going to cover that a little bit today. Uh, so um, sanctification unto holiness is becoming salt and light. Take your Bibles if you would. We're just doing a little introduction to get into chapters 1 and 2 today. We're going to go through those and uh, put some meat to the principle we learned last week. But this is a, a familiar passage. When you get there, you'll, you'll, you'll be familiar with it. Matthew 5, Sermon on the what? Mount, that's, there we go. And the Bible says, ye are the what? You're the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its what? Taste, its flavor, savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that, you, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So the whole process of sanctification is to change you from the old life under Adam to Christ's likeness so that when people see you, they say, wow, I see a different type of light or salt. What does salt make? Usually what does salt make you? It makes you what? Thirsty. And so that thirsty for the word. And so we're to be salt and light. So I could ask you this. Is your light distinguishable? Is it seen clearly? Is it burning rightly? Or is it hid under a bushel? Or is it so, so faint that you really can't see it? And then how's your salt? When people are around you, are they thirsty for what you have in Christ? And that's where we want to get. And James says, 
that's where you need to get no matter what you're, what you're facing. See, the greatest witness of God to others is to change life. That's, that's the big thing. It's not what you say. You can come in here and you can spout and say, I've memorized the whole Bible. Well, that's great. But that's not what it's talking about. The changed life is that what you're learning is literally changing you. And people that know you are looking at you and saying, oh my goodness, what is going on? I knew you. And I'm seeing this, and I'm not seeing that anymore. Why is that? Well, I haven't arrived yet, but God is what? He's working on me. He's what? Changing me. So it isn't how much knowledge you have, and I'm glad you have knowledge, because without knowledge you can't grow, but it isn't about how much you know. It's not being a theological warehouse of just knowing everything like a computer file. It is, it, is, it is talking about that literally what you are learning is changing you, and that's what James wants to concentrate on you. Is the Word of God, is your faith changing you? Because faith without works is what? It's dead. It's useless. It means nothing. So that's, James is really pushing that really hard because I'll tell you that the greatest witness, uh, a witness of God to others is a changed life. They see outward change that they might want to know what caused that change, that outward change. It gives opportunity to share the gospel with others. Now, of course, you know, we don't clean up the outside, right? We're not about cleaning up the outside. We, wanna, we want the inside to be changed, and when the insides change, the outside follows. It just follows. We don't look at things as standards. We just look at it as a way we say, you know, I'm, I have liberty to do that, but I'm not going to do it because it might cause somebody that's watching me to have a distraction on my Jesus. On my Jesus, so I'm just gonna I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay away from certain things. So we don't look at it as grievous or that we're being punished. We're just like saying, listen, I just don't want anything to be a distraction for someone not to see the cross correctly. We want to make sure in our life and our walk that the cross is very distinguishable. That's what we want to do. Um, so that's the greatest witness, and I, I hope that is making a change. I know. Some of you got saved at a young age, and so you grew up in a Christian home, and sometimes you don't see as much, but for those of us that got saved later in life, our friends really saw a major change in us, and they either fled from us, or they, um, a lot of them maybe don't hang out with me anymore, but they're still in contact with me because they know there was a change, and I think every once in a while they just want to find out that it's really still happening. That's the way my mom was. You know, my mom told my wife, because my wife got saved five years after me, she said, just let him settle down. He'll, he'll be back with us. Don't worry. It's just, a, it's just a phase. Just a phase. But she had to admit later, even though she didn't agree with Nancy and I after Nancy got saved too, but she had to say there is something different. There is something different. And that's not to bring it on us, but when they say that, what do we say? It's the cross. It's the cross. That's what's changed me. And so the changed life is important. They see an outward change and they, they want to say that. So James brings us through his letter, uh, the realness of Christianity. He really wants to say, hey, listen, um, don't waste your life. Uh, trials and the word of God ought to be changing you to produce works that are authentic. So every time then, let me give this illustration. I've given this before. Um, one of the scariest things I have, and I do it more than anything else, is I really don't like to fly. Um, I still put my hand now on the thing there. I always say to my wife, we're going to play, and I say, I'm doing what Jan <laughs> Janet told me to do. And uh, always make sure the pilots are okay. Hey, everything okay at home? Anybody having a meltdown today? You know, where you been the last three hours? You know, you okay? Uh, and, and so on. And I get on there, and I really don't like it. In fact, I've sent text messages <laughs> to my wife before where I put it in there and I sent it and I said, um, or I put it in my email in case something happened, I said, the, the right engine looks a little funny. If something happens, I want you to have this in my email and I'll send that email off before I leave. I've actually called the flight attendant over and said, I don't know, that doesn't sound right. I'm on planes all the time and that engine doesn't sound right. <laughs> I know, I know, I just don't like it. But anyways, I get on the planes anyways and I fly. But um, if something rocks my apple cart, it's flying. I really don't care for it. I try to sleep or try to stay busy while I'm up there. But what rocks your apple cart is what James wants to deal with or what the Lord wants to deal with so that when your apple cart's rocked, all the apples don't fall out. 
But let's picture here visually. You got this cart of apples, and you're, you're pushing it along, and you get rocked. Something happens in your life. I don't know. You have a meltdown, uh, whatever might happen, and that whole apple cart falls over. What happens to the apples? They scatter everywhere, right? And then you got to get on the ground, and you got to spend time trying to get all your apple carts, that's all your emotions, that's everything, back into the cart, all your emotions, everything back, because they've been so uh, rocked that your testimony of the Christ is out the window, because maybe the way you acted or responded to that is out the window. And what happens to those apples when they fall on concrete and roll all over the place? They get bruised. They get hurt. And sometimes we don't get over that bitterness or that anger or that thing that happens to us. And so what James is saying is that as we get into this, is, is the whole book is about this, is that when you're pushing your apple cart, that's all your emotions, that's everything about you, that's your whole being, emotions, your intellect, your will, is that when things come and rock you, which they will, you get a phone call and somebody passes away or you hear something about a friend being hurt or something like that, is that the apple cart might shake a little bit, but it doesn't turn over. And James says, what I'm seeing with some of you is I'm seeing that um, your faith, but when I every time something comes into your life, it, 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 the way you respond to people, the way you treat people, the way you do things, your whole apple cart just spills all over the place. And then you can't grow because you're trying to get all the apples back in. All your emotions are all over the place. You're depressed then or whatever, and you're just not going on with life. And you're allowing every little event and circumstance in your life, you're trying to manage it, and it is, it is really causing a problem. So... He, he gives that, that, that illustration there. I hope that helps you. So that's what, that's, that's what he wants to do here. He wants to help us to see that growing faith produces genuine works. But we have to figure out what works are, which we covered a little bit last week. Are you with me? Okay. Have, you, have, you, have you, any of you ever chased your apples down? I have. And many times I've had to go find those apples, and some of them rolled pretty far. Right? Some get, you know, get things in them we don't want in them either. Take care of your apple cart. You can't, but God can. So, so, so Jesus, uh, James brings us uh, through his letter, the realness of Christianity. James is showing us the importance of the authentic, of, of, authenticity of our faith. The Bible dwells on two great themes, the way to God, and the second theme, the walk with God. And this epistle centers on the walk with God. James gives us... Practical analysis of the walk with God. So the theme, uh, we mentioned this last week, this is all repetitive, what we're saying right here in these two paragraphs. The theme James uh, gives us repeatedly is stated this way. If your faith is genuine, then your walk will be what? Authentic. It really will. It'll be natural. You don't have to fake it. Hey, how many of you lived fake in front of people? You really weren't what you really are. That's happened to me too. You're, you're a hypocrite in that area of your life. And what James is saying is that if you allow God to change you, then there will be a genuine faith that brings genuine works. You don't have to be phony. You don't have to have a facade on, on Wednesday and Sunday. And then Monday through Saturday is a whole different life. Is a whole different life. So through God's word and through trials, he places us... Our lives, uh, he, he, he places in our lives uh, change, uh, God's word and trials. Uh, genuine faith will produce good works that turn into maturity. So the whole thing here is to get to maturity. We want to get to maturity. Gracie really grew up today. She came out of the nursery and told me that she was in charge of the nursery right now. And, uh, and uh, that they were not getting along, but she was going back in to work it out. That's pretty good. How old's Gracie? Six. She's ready. She's ready. She has taken a leader position in the nursery. In fact, I'm going to approach her today and ask her if she wants to run the nursery for us. But it's amazing if she's in the nursery and there's someone else older in there, then they got to straighten her out, right? <laughs> but it's amazing. And that's what God wants to do. You know, he really wants us to get us to maturity. How's your maturity, really? How's the apple cart? 
So through God's word, we have these trials that God puts into our life. God wants to remove the wavering. I wish Lynn was here because he pulled me to the side last week after the message. He said, I think the word you want to use there is wavering. I was so excited to have it in here, and he's not here. So I'm go somewhere else. Uh, but God wants to move that wavering in our faith, those areas that have too much clay in them, too much dross in them, is what he wants to work on there. Can you please tell him I use that word? And uh, the dross in our faith to mature us to good works. So in these five chapters, James gives us four principles. We, we covered them last week. We need to be aware of. The end result is found in James 1.4. Now, we're going we're gonna to look at James 1.4 in context, but, but, it, but this is the end result of if we learn these principles and they're active in our life, is but let patience have her what? Perfect work that you may be what? Perfect. That's mature and entire, wanting nothing. So in other words, the fulfillment that God gives you through those changes in your life to be more Christ-like is actually very fulfilling. We have a God-shaped hole for salvation, and we have a God-shaped hole for sanctification. That God-shaped hole is nothing will satisfy us outside of Christ. Religion, works, whatever, it will never satisfy that yearning we have. But once we're saved, that God-shaped hole is filled, but then there's a God-shaped hole that only um, allowing God to change us is the only the real joy that we can find in this life. Okay, so chapter one. Here was the principle from last week. Uh, growing faith produces genuine stability. So you notice that the work it produces is not that you uh, go and mow people's lawns, that you take care of the sick, that you feed the poor, those are all important, but that's not the works he's talking about here. He is saying that if you have growing faith, God will remove that dross so that, you're, so that you will be genuinely uh, stable. Stability. Stability is important. Hey, listen, if you're going to push your apple cart, you have to have stability. You can't be knocked off your feet every time some circumstance comes into your life. And so what, 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 what James is saying is, you, you're going to need to be stretched, but don't worry, it won't break you. See, God doesn't stretch us to break us in a sense of no value. He stretches us to break us in a good way. But we have an adversary, the devil. He just wants circumstances to so overwhelm you that you just quit. You just quit. You say, it's not worth it. I'm picking up these apples every day, and I'm tired of picking them up. In fact, I don't even know where half of them are anymore. And, and, and that's, not, that's not what he's talking about here. When God stretches us, it doesn't break us to a point of quitting. It actually breaks us to the point of growth. So it produces authentic stability. But let's look in our text. Uh, James chapter 1. Let's look at uh, uh, 2, 3, and 4. Now remember when we see... Johnny, I need water really bad. I'm so sorry. I get a headache here. Just anything. Just in your hand is fine. Um, so it says here, my brethren, and we know what we have when we have my brethren, right? What does that mean? It means all of us that are born again. So he's talking to you and me and all of us in here are born again. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That means many different sizes and looks of temptations. Knowing this. So he says, okay, Knowing this, Paul uses this often in some of his epistles as well. Knowing this, in other words, it's almost like saying you should know this. That to try in your faith work is patience. That's what it does. It, it, it slows you down and, and, it, and it works in you so that you can see this blind spot that you have that's causing your apple cart uh, to always be overturned, this ability that you need. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. One is called it the uh, polka dot trials. So you polka dots come in all different sizes and shapes, and they come in different shapes, and they dot the landscapes of our life. So God already knows what we need because the Word of God opens us up, shows us. God knows us inside and out. And so God hurdles on purpose trials into our life to remove dross that's causing our faith to not be pure. God wants our faith to be stretched like an athlete, like someone that goes and works out. He works out with more weight than he can 
so that eventually it builds up his muscle. Thank you. Wow, that's a lot of water there. Um, and so um, that's, that, that's what's on. So, so, so God hurdles those into our life because they're not chastisement. Now make sure that sometimes we get confused. If we're living unrighteous and we are living what's not true, then it's not a trial, it's actually a chastisement. You challenge your children to grow, don't you? Okay, but when they're doing wrong, you, don't, you, you, you chastise them. Hey, that's wrong. But when otherwise, you're just like, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on, you know, and you put them in a position where they have to be stretched a little bit. And that's what, that's what God does. So God never rewards um, disobedience with a trial. He chastises. Praise God, as Randy brought that up a little bit today. Uh, the different kinds of trials, like duration, some trials go for a long time. Uh, some trials can go almost a whole lifetime. Well, we know it did for, um, for the Apostle Paul. He said, I have a deep thorn. We don't know what that thorn was. He has a deep thorn, and God's not going to remove it, but he says, my grace is what? Sufficient. So that trial, uh, he got up every day with it, and um, sometimes they last that long. And the depths of the trials, sometimes they can go pretty deep. And we face, uh, our response should be, count it all joy. Why? Your faith is being tested. God is exposing weaknesses in our faith. You say you have faith, God wants to expose the dross that's preventing your faith to take the next steps of dedication. That's what's happening. That's what trials do. They get us on the move again. They're blind spots. We don't see them. And so God gets in there and he says, hey, 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 you're, de you're deficient in this area. You're weak in this area. You're, you're giving place to the devil in this area. There's, there's, there's a difficulty here. And as he exposes it through that trial, we see it. And we say, oh my goodness, and we correct it biblically, and then God can use us in a greater way, a greater way. I hope that that is what you are seeing. So count it all joy, I think for several reasons. I think we count it all joy that God loves us, and that's the price of love, that God comes after us in trials to change us into the image of his dear son. So that's the price of love, but also that um, if we can learn it, then we can be more effective for God. Before, I wasn't stable, and because of this trial, now this trying of my faith, this polka dot trials that I'm going through, I am now going to be able to be stable with my apple cart. I, I wasn't stable. I thought I was, but I wasn't. Now, this is not all the trials that God puts us through. We're just pointing out the three here that, or the four here that, that, um, that James is pointing out to this group of scattered Believers, your faith is being tested. God is exposing weakness in your faith and so that we can take the next step. The other joy is this. There's a lot of people graduating high school, and I think they're pretty joyful right now. They are glad they are done with high school. But if you get your report card and you find out you got to redo your senior year, you're not going to be overly happy, right? How many of you repeated a year? I repeated fourth grade. It was terrible. It was terrible. Terrible thing to go through. But anyways, so, so you have to do it again. And, and so when you learn the lesson and you start applying what God has taught you, the joy is, wow, I don't have to go through that instability I had before. Whatever that instability was, you can put whatever that is that causes you to have a meltdown. You could probably raise your hand right now. You probably don't want to tell us, but you can raise your hand right now and tell us what causes you to have a meltdown. And God says, wait a minute, I want to take that away from you. Why? So that when people see you, they don't see your apple cart and you picking up apples all the time, because that's what they do. And so when they see you, they look and they say, okay, why are you seem like you're keeping things together? It's the cross. It's Christ. It's Christ. And so that's what James says, I want to see in your life. He's very practical in this. So verse 4 says, um, uh, uh, look, uh, verse 4 says, uh, but let patience have her perfect work. Uh, thing, uh, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. How many of you have ever um, spent hours uh, setting up the dominoes just right so when you push the first one, you know, you can watch them go? You do that. I used to do that all the time. I'd set them up and, or two of them at the same time and race them. And then you're like halfway through and you accidentally bump one. You got to go back. You got to start it all over again. It's really frustrating. That, that, that messes up my apple cart. But, um, but 
let me just say this. Let the dominoes fall. Because when you push that first one, it actually opens up a lot more. And so let God have his way, his perfect work in the trial. It might be more than just the first domino falling. Let the dominoes fall. Let God remove the dross to grow and produce a maturity that lacks nothing. Could you imagine to be stable where... Um, in that one area, we're not talking about completely stable in every part of your life. I don't think anybody ever arrives, so we're not saying that. But all of a sudden, God gives you stability in that one area of your life. What a joy that is uh, to have that done and, um, and, and, and to see that work. Yes, you were going to say something. Amen. 1 John 4, 4. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <coughs> yeah. You know, some people put them on their mirror, their verses, so when they're in in the morning getting ready, or they'll, you know, put them somewhere where they go often so they can get that verse into their mind. <coughs> um, so the dominoes fall, and the result of maturity is, is complete and lacking nothing. That's how we go from milk to meat. That's how we get out of the nursery. Quit playing in the nursery. There's no reason to be in the nursery anymore. The nursery is understanding salvation. Once, once you get saved, it's time to start already learning so you can get out of, thank you, out of, um, out of, the, out of the nursery and into uh, the meat. The meat's the best part of, of God. Okay. Okay. Um, so we go from milk to meat. Ever been, oh, you ever been around, I'm, I shouldn't even mention this because that's probably redundant now, but you ever been around a little toddler and they're always asking why? Are they at that age? Almost. Why? Why? Why is it, you've been through that because you got older kids now. It's just, why, 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 why? Because! <laughs> How many whys is it to the center of my apple cart? <laughs> So if you stay that way as a believer, then you stay in the infancy. You're always going to be asking God, why, why, why? God says, sometimes you just have to trust me, and sometimes there is a reason. And if you understand that he's trying to, to make you perfect so that you don't have a meltdown, you'll quit asking why. But if you stay in the nursery, everything that happens to you is going to be why, 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 why? But we need to grow. So that we can be stronger. And the goodness of God is always the correct way. I remember as a little kid not understanding something. We were pulling into Burger King. And this is a long time ago where there wasn't as much you know, violence as we see today. But we were pulling in. All of a sudden my dad started screaming at my brother and I, get down, get down, get down. Well, we got down. We didn't know what was going on. I mean, we didn't understand it. I guess a guy had, um, the police were there and a guy had, uh, was entering into the uh, Burger King with a gun. And my dad saw the police officer coming in, and I don't know if he saw the gun or I don't know what, but somehow he just got down. I was young, maybe seven, seven years old, maybe eight. I don't, I don't remember how young I was. And I remember um, asking my dad later that day, I said, uh, why would someone do that? You know, why would someone go in and, you know, stick the place up? You know, seven years old. I said, why, why would someone do that? And my dad said to me, um, he said, they lose touch with reality. Well, what does that mean to a seven-year-old? <laughs> oh. Thanks, Dad. That nailed it. <laughs> and I remember asking him, well, what's reality? <laughs> you know, I mean, what? I didn't even know what that word was. <laughs> okay, and if we stay and don't allow God to do these trials in our life, we'll always be asking, well, what's reality? What's this? What's that? But if we allow God to really get deep into us, uh, we'll understand. And in fact... We'll be glad when we do have trials. So don't stop short of all God has for us as believers. Just don't be satisfied with the cross. There's so much more. There's so much more than just salvation. Praise God, salvation's first and foremost, right? We're so thankful for our salvation. I'm not making it any lighter at all. That is the, that is the, the need. But don't stop short here. God has so much more for us as believers. 
if you lack wisdom, you can't quite understand this. You're like, I don't like trials. They freak me out. They're too much. I mean, you know, I'm afraid God's going to do this or do that. Then you've misunderstood. Well, she's reading the attributes of God. Um, then you've missed who God is. You, you have him as a hurtful God that's going to punish you or take your children away or burn your house down or make your car break down. That's not, that, that's, that's not God. So th listen to this. He even gives an answer for that. Look at James 1.5. So if you're, we, we quote this verse all the time, big popular verse, but in context you see what it means now. So he says, if any of you lack wisdom, what? Who give it to all men liberally. It's the only time you can be a liberal. And upbraideth not. And it, should, and it shall be given him. So, in other words, what you have here is that in the context of why James is saying this, some of you are so afraid of trials that you run from them. You never let them come into your life. You never learn anything. You're not changing at all. Go to God and ask him for some wisdom about trials, and he'll let you know how important trials are. And then you can allow them into your lives because you're preventing these trials. You're running from them. You're trying to get away from them. And God says, wait a minute, these are good for you. These are not chastisement. This is so that you don't have to live in the past anymore. You don't have to live with past hurts. You don't have to live with what happened a uh, hundred years ago. You don't have to anymore. You can, you can, I've forgiven it, it's gone, whatever. We can move forward. That's what he's saying here. God will give the wisdom to continue to endure. It must be asked in faith. He covers verse, um, verses about trials and then he brings it back together in verse number 12. He says, because we're not doing verse by verse, it says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried, what? There we go. A crown of life. Now remember the word temptation um, can um, mean temptation and it can mean trial. So how do you know which one he's talking about? Because he uses temptation with um, Abraham where clearly Abraham was going through a trial. They called it a temptation. Remember, temptation is neutral, so it's the context of the text. Because it could be either one. It could be either one. So, so yeah, uh, Joseph wasn't uh, tempted. He was going through a trial. He was going through a trial. He was not being punished. He was going through a trial. Same thing with Abraham. But there are times that temptation is to sin. We certainly have that. But when he is tried, he shall receive, because nothing, nothing can come from the Lord that's evil, so it can't be from the Lord. And then in verse 13, he changes to temptation, though. But he does say uh, the, 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 the chain of temptation but every man is tempted now he's talking about a uh, sin when he's drawn how do we know that well look at what it says here when he's drawn away by his own what lust and enticed then when lusts have conceived that bringeth forth what and sin when it's finished bringeth forth death we all uh, we all death and sin we all die from sin so the cause of death could be um, a heart attack it could be a car accident but basically we all die because of sin. We have a, we have a sin problem. And then, uh, do not err, my beloved brethren. So there's a difference there. The, the wisdom of allowing temptations in your life in the good way, the trials, is it makes you better. But, but, but temptation, when, it, when, it's, when it's done for you to live lustful ways, is, is not good. Is not good. So what gives us stability when we are going through difficulties is the stability of God's word. Uh, verse 17, every what? Good gift and every perfect gift comes from where? And comes down from the Father of lights, whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be uh, kind of first fruits of his creatures. In other words, all the good gifts come to us and they bring fruit for us. The chapter closes with an emphasis on the scriptures. The only thing that gives stability when uh, our faith is stretched is his precious word. Where do you go when you're, when, you're, when you're going through a trial? You ought to go to where? God's word. That's, 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 um, that's where we want to be. And then um, let me continue here because James um, 19 through 27 is hearing and doing the word of God. Um, I'll read 19, you read 20. We'll go back and forth. 
This is a series here that uh, ends the chapter, and it's really the whole premise is hearing and doing the um, uh, doing what the word says. Wherefore, because of everything I've just said, my beloved brethren, all believers, let every man to be be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So in other words, if your apple cart's always turning over, it doesn't work the righteousness of God. There's no, there's no value in that. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, superfluity, naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engraft word which is able to save your souls. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Right, we know, we know what that is, right? You look in the glass and you don't make the changes. You, there's egg all over your face or, you know, you, you, got, you didn't shave right and it's, it's all patchy and you just take off anyways. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, we're talking about his word, and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So that's just another thing we got to learn how to bridle our tongue. Well, who can control the tongue? Only God. You cannot control your tongue. Only, only God can control your tongue. We'll get to that when we get to James 3. And then um, he goes on here on pure religion. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself, what? Just being unspotted from the world. Just stay separated from the world. It does not have your best interest. There isn't, uh, Hollywood's not getting together tonight saying, hey, how can we start discipling these believers? Let's, let's, let's get a series of shows out there that are really going to really excite them about living for Jesus. We'll have them going to church on Sunday, and we'll have like a robust preaching for 20 minutes of the show, and then the last 10 we'll give an invitation, and we'll see them growing. I don't think they're doing that. I think they're seeing how they can tear down the very fabric of who God is so that you'll be self-dependent and you don't need him. So be careful out there. You have to be wise. Only, only Our problem is not hearing the word, but doing the word. We all receive it. You're all receiving it tonight. I am too. But are we actually doing it? Okay, second one starts in chapter 2. And so that principle which is more than just one, but it, 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 the, the, the text backs up it. It says, real faith produces genuine love. When pressed, it doesn't fail, of course. Whenever God is working on trying to show us something that's in our life, it never, it never, it never um, overwhelms us, it never sidelines us, but it produces an authentic love. So real faith produces a genuine love, that we really love the brethren, that we really care for one another. I mean... We don't have partiality for some people. So chapter 2 deals with our second principle, partiality and prejudice. He is looking for authentic love here. Here he once again starts with the word brethren. We see that here. He starts with um, brethren in uh, 2.1. So he's talking to believers 15 times. He uses brethren. So he's talking directly to all believers in Christ alone. Don't hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with an attitude of favoritism. And he gives the example of a man that comes in and whoever greets him is short-sighted. He's nearsighted. And instead of just sitting him wherever, he looks and he sees, oh, he's got a big ring and he's got a big wad of money and he looks important. I'm going to really take care of him. But the other person over here, who cares about them? Oh, sit wherever. I'm, 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 I'm busy right now. I'm taking care of this family. Why? Because he thinks there's great gain in that person. Partiality. Where we treat some people one way and ignore others. There's some people we're just going to ignore them. They, they gross us out. They, they, oh, oh, that, oh, they bother me. And we can't do that as believers. And so what, 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 how do we get to genuine and authentic love is allowing those... Um, uh, trials to come into our life so that we would really have a genuine love for other people. A genuine love. 
And that's the example he uses here about um, this man that comes into the congregation in, in verse 2 and 3. And you have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing and say unto him, sit thou here in a good place and say to the poor, stand thou here or sit here under my footstool. That was happening in the book of Corinthians um, where they were having two different Lord's suppers. They were having a supper before the supper and they were taking the poor people, the slaves that couldn't really afford to bring food in and they were leaving them upstairs and they were going downstairs, the rich ones were, and they were bringing, you know, the lobster and the steak and they were, they were picking out, and when they were coming on upstairs them for the Lord's table, oh, they were full, and the poor people had nothing. Instead of inviting them to their table, they made two different tables. And that ought not to be. And that ought not to be. And that can be here. You could really, you could really have somebody right here in this congregation that you are against them in a way. You have partiality towards them. There's not real love there. You would not reach out to them unless you were maybe shamed into doing it. And so he goes on here and he talks a little bit more. We won't go too much into it, but you have, it says, uh, Hearken, my beloved brethren, uh, have not God chose the poor of this world rich in faith? You know, their faith is the same as yours. God smiled upon you, maybe gave you a job that, you know, you can use your money in a great way. That's all great. But what he's saying here is that, you know, those, all that are saved are co-equal. There's not one over the other. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat. Um, so he goes on and he talks about that problem there. And then... Um, the main part of it is found in um, verses 14 through 26. We'll get through that and we'll end. Uh, 14 through 26 says this, the statement in, in verse number 14. Um, let me just go back there real quick. I, I don't want to shortchange anything. You know, partiality will rock your apple cart too. It, it'll stop your spiritual growth. If, 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 if God has shown you that through a trial and we don't, get that right it's going to cause problems um so 14 says what doth it profit my brethren there's brethren again so we've sung to the believers though a man say he have faith and have not works can faith save him if you have authentic faith in jesus christ let me get through this whole statement because it might sound at first what i'm saying is not right but it is right in a sense of the whole context of the paragraph if you have authentic faith in Christ, in Jesus Christ, you will now have true works that follow. Works do not save a person, but works after salvation prove you have been saved. All those works are what we have learned um, already in this letter. Stability in the midst of our circumstances and authentic love and partiality. So in other words, um, our, our, our works don't save us, but our faith is dead our faith is no good if if um authentic faith is, is is that works follow faith so if you are genuinely born again there will be good works that come through your life and some of those works are we see here uh those works are is that we are more stable we 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 don't have partiality towards other we do have authentic love that we've covered so far he goes on further in the text, and in James 2.15 says, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be warm and be filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are of need of the body, what does it profit? So in other words, he's, he's going back to the original. He says, Listen, if you're really saved, you need to have genuine love. You can't say to your brother, Oh my goodness, what a sad story. Man, no wonder those kids' feet are all cut up and stuff. They have no shoes. That's terrible. God bless you. And then you just go. And you have the means and the opportunity to help out. You have the means and the opportunity to help out, and you don't, is what he's saying here. That you, 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 you could and you don't, then that's dead faith. That's dead faith. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead being alone. So works have nothing to do with being saved. 
But once we're saved, it's automatic then that there'll be works. And what are those works? Genuine love is the one that he's talking about in this one. It can be many others, but he's showing it right there that you really do have a care for others that are hurting and are without. Um, um, now, now people say, well, I wonder if he's out there gambling his money. Well, we're not going to get into all the things it could be. Let's just take it at face value here. Someone comes into the congregation and they need to help. We ought to try to help them out the best we can. Certainly if there's addictions there, then we need to work through those addictions. And if there's, and if there's larceny there and there's thievery there and there's laziness there, we need to work through all that. We can't just keep giving people money when they're not accountable to it. Well, we know that. That's a gimme. Let's not go there. Let's not get our mind there. Our mind is this. We ought to have a real genuine spirit to want to help everything we possibly can to get that person back where to where they need to be, where they need to be. I think that really our, our faith is dead. It's really dead. The key word in our text is dead. Uh, the biblical faith that saves you is not, is not faith alone. It's a kind of faith that will be followed by works of righteousness because saving faith is of righteousness. So that righteousness is then turns into works. My faith Produces works. It, 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 it just automatically produces work. Your faith is by the imputed righteousness of Christ, and that type of faith is always followed by works, like that faith that preceded the works. In the text, the context is authentic love, no partiality. If not, your faith is dead. Uh, when you get saved, everything changes. You have compassion for people that you maybe never had compassion for before, or you ought to. He's saying, and then in James 2.20 he says, Will, will thou o, know, O vain man, that faith without works is what? Dead. And that word there means what? Useless. Your faith is useless. And then the next week we'll cover chapter 3 and 4. Faith produces genuine humility. And chapter 5 is real faith produces genuine patience. And we'll cover those two and we'll be done with James. Any comments or anybody want to throw anything in there? This is an educated group. You guys have been around the block a little bit. Anybody want to share anything? Yeah. Right. And you know that, and then when they get mixed up there, it would be like a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness would say, works are me going out and knocking on door. Works are me doing this. Works is me is doing this. When really what James is saying is the works there is literally the trials that change us to be more stable, to have authentic love. That's the type. It's not the works of buying someone's shoes. It's that you, you, you genuinely love them so you will buy them a pair of shoes. It isn't buying the shoes. It's that you love someone so much that you care about what their needs are at that moment, whether it's food, whether it's shelter, whatever it is. So, so James is talking about that, that our works are literally trials that are coming to our life to change us to be more stable, to be more genuine love, to persevere, to have humility, so on. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. 
And so that's what he's saying, so let's back that up. That's the end result. But, but, but really what he's saying in here is that God's going to give every one of us in here genuine love, and we're either going to quit, we're just shaking off that trial, and we're not allowing God to change us to enter into other people's lives. Because the entering into people's lives is then the physical work, but that's not what he's talking about there. He's talking about that there would be a change in you to recognize it and be willing to enter into it. He's not judging you on what you do after you enter into it. Like, there's like this is extra rewards because you, you know, buy him shoes or something. That's what he's talking about. The, the, the growth is that you would, uh, you're, you would just recognize it right away. The Holy Spirit just show you that and you'd be willing to enter into it. Not say, oh my goodness, that person needs a lot of work. I'm sitting over here. <laughs> And I am not going to get anywhere near them. I'm not even going to, if I look at them, they might think that I'll help them. I'm not going to do any of that at all. I am, let's get out of here right away. Don't talk, don't, don't talk to that guy or don't talk to that family. They'll suck the blood out of you. That's what we're talking about. Authentic love says, hey, you got some infirmities. You got some addictions. Let's work through them. It isn't just buying them shoes. That's the end result. But it's really recognizing and having authentic love. Sure. Yeah, I can see that that happens too. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's good. Yep. Yeah, because when we counsel someone like that, we don't say, "Well, I've been through this, and this is what I did." Because they're polka dot trials. Everyone's different. Your, your trial's not like theirs exactly. You can't give them the same advice. The main thing to do is just take them to the scriptures and give them Bible verses and let the Holy Spirit work. Let the Holy Spirit work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because if you really think about it, um, this whole passage over there in James 2 is, is all about fruit and seeing the fruit you have. And, and you can't produce fruit on your own. It has, God, God's the only one that he produces it through you. That's why those crowns of life and everything like that, when we get to heaven, we're going to do what with them? We're going to hang them on our wall. I'm getting a big shelf, and I'm going to put all of mine by my mansion on level two. So when you walk in, you'll see them all. No. What is we going to do? We're going to say, oh my goodness, if I keep these crowns, I'm stealing them because the only way that I got them was because God worked through me as an empty vessel because you can do nothing of yourself. <laughs> you have wood, hay, and stubble, right? right? You own your wood, hay, and stubble. You get to keep all that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it has to be the Holy Spirit working in us for sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, John. Sorry. Go, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Remember, if your heart condemns you, it doesn't necessarily mean it was the Holy Spirit. 
So if, if let's say, the, you're, you're, you're condemned, you have to go and look and see if that was a sin. You, someone might have told you when you were six years old that if you um, wore earrings, you are of the devil. And so then all of a sudden, you're condemned because you get earrings, but that's not what the scriptures say. So that's not, that's somebody that told you that lie <laughs> that is the condemning. You have to go and look in the scriptures and make sure that that's the Holy Spirit that's um, condemning you and not somebody, yeah, told you some legalistic comment and you are living by it still, like you can only put on one sock at a time or, you know, or something like that. Or if you don't hang your clothes up at night, you know, God's going to punish you. And so you grow up thinking, oh my goodness, I can't go to bed until I put my clothes away. Now your wife might kill you, but... <laughs> But not God. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there. <laughs> Sick him, <'em>, God. <laughs> What's that? Yeah. Yeah, well, he's talking about evil there because we can see he's talking about evil, but God tempts us or, or, or not tempts us in the sense of evil, but he does, he does um, hurdle trials into our life, but those are good things. But yeah, he never, he never tempts us with evil, that's for sure. Okay. All right. Well, James is good, and next week we'll, we'll finish her up. We'll finish the, 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 the book up. Father, thank you now for today, and thank you for our time together. It, it goes so quick. There's so much to learn. There's so much to apply there's so much to change there's but it's helping us to get out of the nursery room it's helping us to make our faith real so we won't be always asking why 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 because we'll know because we'll experience the goodness of you when we when we respond to the trials we'll grow and we'll be able to be mature as um uh to 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 actually lead others in these things and so father thank you for that and so we do pray certainly for ann we pray for um those that uh the infirmities we pray for lynn as we get closer and closer to his procedure coming up here and lord we just pray that they'll stay healthy and that uh, they'll be able to go through the procedures well we do pray for the cancer here with um ann and uh, already uh, in stage three before she even gets started. So we do pray for comfort. we thankful that Bob has her ear. May he be a comfort to her and be able to pray with her and, and help her. May our church be able to maybe write her some letters or cards and, and tell her that we're praying for her. And then we do pray for his wife. We pray for Ron. And then, of course, every person in here has infirmities. We all do. Could be a sore hip, bad eyes. Uh, all kinds of things going on in our life, and we just have to trust you through them. And uh, some of them are just the reality of growing older. And so we do ask that you will continue to bless us. Thank you for our young ones. So exciting to see them outside playing basketball and all laughing and, and, and having a good time. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that our, our youth ought to be excited. They, 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 they ought to be um, enjoying life at that age and knowing though that there is a um, right and wrong though so uh, lord bless us encourage us help us have some good fellowship we pray in christ's name amen and can we just get a quick count one two three four five six seven eight nine twenty one twenty one thank you is that including lynn or not was that including lynn or not okay <laughs>